And so this is a, a fairly generic six-stage uh, process that can be applied to any organization, whether it's a for-profit organization like yours, or non-for-profit, or a governmental agency, or NGO. You need to begin with an objective. And I urge my clients to start the process by identifying specific growth opportunities, which could be a new emerging market that nobody else occupies. It could be uh, an existing market where the current incumbents are weak. It could be an emerging technology or a, a new customer segment. You Identify an opportunity. You Identify the opportunity, then you do a critical analysis, an inventory of your existing capabilities, internal capabilities, as well as your weaknesses. What are your deficiencies? What capabilities do you lack that you need in order to exploit those growth opportunities? And then the rest of the, the process is fairly straightforward, so again, I, I won't elaborate it. Uh, there are various models, project management models, and uh, various kinds of software packages that can facilitate the process. Uh, stage three, aligning the organization with the strategy. It is typical of multinational corporations that strategy is treated as a top-down process. Obviously, the CEO, the, the, the senior leadership, has to take the lead in high-level strategy. But at the same time, there must be efforts to engage the broader organization. On a day-to-day -day basis, you know this, people are immersed in their jobs and they have specific tasks to do and specific performance metrics that they, they need to be to satisfy their supervisor. And under those circumstances, it's very difficult sometimes to get them to engage the big picture, the strategy, where the company is going. No matter how carefully thought out or well-constructed your strategy is on paper, in the end, it's going to depend upon a sustained implementation by the organization, which really underscores the importance of finding ways of engaging the broader organization, which could mean bringing in middle-level managers. Uh, it could even mean engaging the workers on the floor, This uh, gaining their perspectives, and this helps to engender excitement and enthusiasm. It helps to uh, what we call buy-in, engaging the organization in the broader strategic effort. <coughs> now the Cap and Martin approach, it is sequential stages one through six, but it does involve a continuous loop, a continuous improvement, of checking your progress, identifying what's going right and what's going wrong, and what mid-course corrections do you need in order to align your action plan with the strategy. Let me now move on to the question of uh, you're in AVEC, uh, you are looking at not simply domestic market opportunities, but foreign market opportunities. You can't cover the globe. You've got to make choices in terms of which countries to enter. This specific framework comes from a student of Michael Porter. His name is Pankaj Gemawat. Uh, and it's called the CAGE Framework, C-A-G-E. And it's a framework to measure distances between countries, distance conceived in terms of cultural, administrative, geographic, and economic difference. And ultimately this measurement, the outcome is used to make choices. Of uh, which country to enter? Right. The, 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 uh, now, I use this framework to sensitize my American students to the need to understand the culture, the nuances of foreign markets. Uh, it's important for anybody involved in international <coughs> business to, to do this, but it's particularly important for uh, many Americans who, frankly, don't have uh, much experience in foreign markets. They may speak only one language. And we have made a concerted effort here at the Carlson School to expand their capabilities in terms of understanding foreign cultures. Now, these examples 
looking at two very close countries, United States and Canada, probably the single closest bilateral relationship of any two countries in the world, it would be U.S. and Canada. Two very close countries on all four dimensions, cultural, administrative, geographic, and economic. And so, despite the differences in market size, 330 million people with the U.S. and 35 million people in Canada, Canada is by far the single biggest trading partner for the United States. And it's by far the biggest trading partner for companies based in Minnesota. It is not Japan or the United Kingdom or Germany or China. It is Canada. It's not the fastest growing market, but it's the biggest market reflecting its very close distance from the United States. But even in this case of the closest bilateral relationship that exists between any two countries, there still are important differences between U.S. and Canada. Certain cultural nuances that distinguish a, a, a U.S. company uh, from a Canadian company. An example, a local company, Target, you're probably familiar with it. It's the big retail company. Very successful. It has launched an expansion into Canada. And, and establishing target retail stores across the border. And there are certain differences, very subtle differences between these two close countries that have created challenges for target with respect to the, the product, the, the lighting of the stores, the pricing points and so on are, are, are different uh, across the border than they are here. Canada, which many American companies frankly regard as a 51st state, has proven challenging for many American companies. Now, the challenges are obviously much greater for the Asian countries where the distances are much greater. Now, in the case of U.S. and Japan, there's an obvious very large geographic distance. There's a very large cultural and ling linguistic difference. But these are two fairly close from a political and economic standpoint, uh, stemming from the American occupation and the close relationship between the two countries. So looking at US and China, the distances are obviously very great uh, across all four dimensions. And this is a point, given the fact that many American companies are looking at China as, 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 as their main growth opportunity but they lack an understanding of the, the differences between the American business environment and the Chinese business environment. Now, as a Chinese-based company looking at American, big American companies like Boeing as potential customers, I think you need to be very mindful of these differences in terms of expectations and business culture. I always advise my students to pay attention to what's going on, the body language, all of these Subtle things, the soft business skills, I think they're very important in addition to the financial analysis and the strategic analysis and so on. And this lesson applies equally to Chinese companies looking at the United States as it does to U.S. looking at China. Sure. So the arrow means the longer the harder. Yes. The longer the harder, okay. So uh, how much influence uh, percentage on these four indicators, how much influence percentage? The weight. Uh, yeah. The weight. Yeah. Well, that's a terrific question. Um, the geographic distances do matter. Despite globalization, despite advances in international transportation and logistics, it is still easier for a U.S. and Canadian company to do business with each other by virtue of the sheer distance than it is for a Chinese company and an American company. So geography does matter, but I think that compared to other things, that it is relatively easier to overcome a geographic distance than it is a cultural distance. So in my personal weighting of this and kind of seeing what American companies do well and what they don't do well, what they often miss is the cultural piece. 
You think the, the character is minor? I think it's most important. Most important. Most important. It's, they're all important, but it's the most difficult. I think geography, you know, currently, for the, for the transportation in, in the world, is very easy. And the cost is lower than, you know, than we expect. So I think maybe culture. I more. agree. Yes. In your industry, I think that the cult, the the beneath the surface cultural yes. issues here are very important and they're most difficult to handle. So that means there's no uh, dedicated data for the each weight, right? No. So it's just uh, based on your uh, different person's perspective to understand this model. Okay. Yes. So uh, the next question is uh, how we consider uh, politic difference in this whole political difference? Yes. Suppose we could lump Admit political in the administrative gap. Again, to be frank here, looking at U.S. China, yes. that there are significant political differences. Right. There are elements of rivalry and cooperation in the U.S. Sino relationship. Yes. And I mentioned earlier Africa and the differing approaches that a company like Sinopec would take when it's looking at South Sudan. Sudan is a country whose president is now an indicted war criminal. It would be very difficult for an American company to do business with that regime. It is easier for Sinopec to do business with th those regimes because of the differing legal structures. Uh, uh, the truth of the matter is that acquisitions by Chinese companies of, Amer of American companies are viewed differently than acquisitions by companies based in Canada or the United Kingdom or Germany or Netherlands. And I think this does underscore the somewhat complex political relationship between U.S. and China. So then in, in this case, the administrative difference is a minor reason. Yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation you're going to be visiting Cirrus and that was an example of an absolute, yes, bring it on. Uh, absolutely, we want uh, a Chinese investor to basically salvage this, this company. But in areas like energy that have a certain political sensitivity, the, the origin of the acquiring company does make a difference. I'm, I'm just stating a fact here. Mary, you would probably agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Now, final point. Is, is take the SWOT model, you probably have seen this, and, and map it onto our earlier discussion of strategic positioning. And we get four generic types of strategies. Where you're, you're a company that has some very strong internal capabilities, and you identify an opportunity. So that's a combination of strength and opportunity. That's probably where you want to be. That is, you're, you've identified an opportunity, there aren't any strong incumbents, and, and, you're, and you're leveraging your strongest assets to attack that, that market. So this would be the most desirable place to be. Now the least desirable position to be would be in the southeast corner, where you're dealing with weaknesses, but you're, you're attacking uh, a market where you have the strongest threats. So, this, so the combination of weakness and and threat is not a good combination. So if this is the most desirable position to be in, this one is probably the least desirable position. The others would be intermediate. You know, where you're, in this case, you're combining internal strengths, which are going up against a well-established market. In this case, you're going up, you have weaknesses, but you have substantial opportunities. So this is just a way of thinking about how you would map your assessment of your internal capabilities with your assessment of the external environment, and then you get a strategic positioning framework. And moving forward, I would urge you, as a point of departure, focus on this. What would a maxi-maxi strategy look like? What, what are your, your existing internal capabilities, your strengths that you can immediately leverage? And what are the what are these where you've got weak, weak incumbents where there are competitive vulnerabilities that you can capitalize on immediately? In the interest of, of, of allocating scarce resources, you don't want to spend time here. You want to be focusing 
on these kinds of strategies. So thanks very much for uh, uh, this morning's session. I'll, I'll, I'm at your disposal. Uh, just contact me by email if you would like to exchange ideas uh, and enjoy the rest of your time here in the Twin Cities and enjoy it to Duluth. Thank you very much.